So, Father, we just thank you that we can stop and come to you and look at your word and look at some things about what this season is all about, what it's meant to be. Uh, we just pray, Father, that you open our hearts, that your spirit teach us the things that we need to know and that we need to understand when it comes to this season. Uh, we just love you, we praise you, and I ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. I've had a lot of people that ask me about this big present right here. Uh, we're giving it away at the end of the second service, so don't leave. You have to be present to win. Uh, raffle tickets will be sold at halftime. So, nah. uh, But no, it's, uh, it's, it's got its purpose. We'll get to that in a minute. You know, Al talked about, uh, just kind of as a side note before I get into my lesson, Al talked about the, the negative side of this, this holiday, uh, of the Christmas season, and uh, that right there plays a big part of it. Um, people... People who, if, if, your, if your Christmas season starts and stops with packages and presents and Santa, and I'm not an anti-Santa person, by the way. I, I, you know, I know there's a faction of the Christian community that doesn't like Santa. There's a faction of the Christian community that's okay with Santa. I look at, you know, the original St. Nicholas, you know, he was a youth guy. He was one of my guys. So, you know, he was all about going out and, and ministering to the youth. So I don't have a problem with Santa Claus, but if that's where your Christmas starts and stops is, with this stuff and the Santas and the trees and all that, then, yeah, I can see where you're going to not be happy this season because you're going to have stuff that's going to bring stress. And you really need to stop and you really need to focus on what this season is all about. And I hope I can steer your, your attitudes toward that this morning. So when Ron asked me to speak, and again, God laid this smorgasbord of, of th topics, one of the, as I was trying to decide on what to speak on, uh, I happened to hear the song, Mary, Did You Know? And it's one of my favorite Christmas songs. And as I sat and I listened to that song, that song presents all these questions throughout it. Uh, and so it got me to thinking, what did Mary know? You know, how much did Mary know? And so uh, I began studying this. Now, uh, let me just clear this up real quick. This is not a Mariology study this morning. You know, we're I, I'm not into the... The, the, whatever denominations think that Mary was some kind of deity. I don't believe that. Uh, matter of fact, it's funny, her name that she's known as ought to tell you, if you understood why, it ought to tell you she's not deity. You know, she's known as the Virgin Mary. And, you know, Ron's taught this for years and years and years, and John, I'm sorry, i got to walk a little bit. But Ron has taught this for years and years and years, we understand virgin birth and why it happened. And if you don't understand virgin birth, then this whole Christian uh, or, or Christ being Savior and all that, it just ma it makes no sense. But she was a virgin because God had to stop the chain of sin. You know, uh, Romans 5.12, because of one man, sin had entered into the world and death by sin, and so sin was passed upon all mankind. Sin was passed from Adam on down. Sin was passed on to the offspring. It was passed on through the father. You know, we've joked around here for years. You don't, you're not bad because you're mommy. You're bad because you're daddy. And so we, you know, it was passed on that way. Well, God says, we've got to stop that. He says, we've got to take the dad out of this. So we've got to have a virgin to have a child that's got to be impregnated by me, by, by God. And so that's the big deal about it. But Mary is a sinner in need of a Savior just like anybody else because she had an earthly father. And so I just want to make sure that we understand this is not about placing Mary in some great position in that regard. Now, I, I do believe Mary was a fairly mature, based on the studies and the, and the research that I've done on Mary as I, put this pro, uh, as I put this message together this morning, I do believe Mary was a pretty spiritually savvy lady. Um, some of the things that she said to me was really intriguing. Mary's the most intriguing woman to me. Her attitude and the role that she was given as Christ's mother was interesting to say the least. From her first encounter with the angel Gabriel uh, all the way to the cross, her statements we find in scriptures re revealed to me that she may have known more than we realize. Um, I personally feel she was much more spiritually savvy uh, her declaration of Christ's mission to earth is one that we should, uh, that only she could deliver, and she delivered it boldly and loudly at the cross. Um, and we're going to see that as we go through this morning. 
Not as lot of, uh, not, there's not a lot said about the mother of Christ uh, in the scripture. She's mentioned in different, you know, in the Christmas story. She's mentioned at the, the um, uh, story of the boy Jesus when he slipped away. She's mentioned at the, um, the, the miracle of Cana where, you know, the water to wine. And, of course, she's mentioned at the crucifixion. Um, in the year 1809, the international scene was tumultuous. Napoleon was sweeping through Austria, just spreading blood everywhere. Nobody was given a lot to the attention of babies. They were much too engaged in what was being considered more important matters. But the world was overlooking some significant births that year. William Gladstone of England, well, was one of England's finest statesmen was born that year. The same year, Alfred Tennyson was born, uh, and he would greatly affect literature. On the American continent, Oliver Wendell Holmes was born. Uh, down the road in, Bo in New England and down the road in Boston, Edgar Allan Poe was born. Um, it was also the same year that Charles Darwin was born. Uh, and also the same year that a man named Abraham Lincoln was born. But if you looked at the headlines and the news of what was going on during that period, all you would see was Napoleon wiping out Austria and all these places in Europe. And you didn't really stop and think about, well, I wonder what these babies are. What's going on with these babies? You know, how are they going to affect history? And yet, these babies that were born that year had a tremendous impact on the world, on society. The same is said about the year that Christ was born. The headline, if there was been a headline in the news, it would have been taxation. Rats, we gotta get we gotta pay more taxes. We gotta go back and get go through this census. They're gonna find out which one of us can pay taxes, find out maybe if some of us are illegal, they're gonna send us away, you know, whatever. But the but the big deal that year was that a baby but that our savior was born. The question in the song that most interests me of Mary, did you know, was the or when he asked the question. Mary, did you know that your baby would one day save your sons and daughters or save the sons and daughters? As an evangelist, that, real, that, that question really intrigues me. Uh, you know, he asks he asked all kinds of questions through the song, you know, healing blind men and walking on water and these things. But the, but the one about Mary, did you know that your son is going to save your, our sons and daughters? Uh, and, so that, and so I wanted to just address what did Mary know? What did Mary know? David kind of, he hit on it before we started church this morning. Uh, and, you know, I thought, well, just hold on a minute now. Before you, before you start coming up with answers, you, let's look at this a minute. So here's what I've concluded. In Luke 1, 26 through 38, if you want to turn there, uh, the angel visits, that we have, we're gonna, and also one in Matthew, we're going to look at the visits of where the angel visits Mary and Joseph. Luke 1, 26, 38. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph and of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. If an angel, I'm, you know, if an angel walked in right now and started talking to me or if an angel snuck into my house unexpectedly, and, I mean, started talking to me, it would scare me to death. I would be terrified. And it's shown up in scriptures when the angel went and spoke to the shepherds and when the angel goes and speaks to Joseph, they're scared. They're terrified. Mary's reaction was, I wonder why he said, said that to me the way he said that. It wasn't, whoo, you know, or, or where's, my, where's my phone? I need a camera. I want to get a picture of this. You know, it wasn't anything like that. It was, it was, why did you say that? Why did you, why did you address me the way you addressed me? Now, the angel continued on, and he says, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now, based on Mary's reaction, I didn't see a lot of fear in what she said. Now, I don't know if, I, I sometimes wonder if the angel may have had this, this scripted speech he was just going to make. Uh, you know, when he walks in, it says, greetings, Mary, don't be afraid. And she's really not, I mean, based on her, her reaction, it doesn't look like she's afraid. It looks like she, her mind is already racing, which I, makes me wonder, is she, is she really into, has she really studied the, the Old Testament scriptures, Isaiah, that talks about all these, 
you know, the, how the Messiah is going to come. Maybe she's up on her Messiah doctrines. Uh, and so when this angel comes in, you know, maybe, you know, girls growing up, when I was a kid, they would grow up hoping one day they would marry a, a movie star, or marry a, uh, you know, some great whatever. Maybe the girls in her day hoped, you know, maybe I can be the, the virgin that's going to bring the Messiah. You know, I, who knows. But, but her reaction was really interesting. It didn't, didn't appear to be fear. It was more of a, a quizzical, like, that was an odd way to address me when you came in. I should be terrified. You're telling me not to be afraid, but I don't see a lot of fear in that. Um, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of, of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Forever. He's not going to be one of these temporary kings. He's going to be the king forever. And his kingdom will have no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason the Holy Child will be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed her. Mary's response was, I'm your servant. That's, that's an attitude of a, of a spiritually mature believer. That's an attitude of a, of a believer that gets up every day and says, Father, I'm here. What do you want me to do? I'm ready. I'm ready to roll. Whereas when the angel went and saw Joseph, Matthew 1, 18 through 25, it says, Now the birth of Jesus was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had uh, considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid and take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be a, a, with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translate God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife and kept her as a virgin until she gave birth to the son and called his name Jesus. So right there we could say, well, yes, Mary did know. Mary knew. She had her, her encounter with the angel. Joseph has his encounter with the angel. They came together and they talked about it. And Mary says, yeah, I'm supposed to name him Jesus. He said, yeah, I know. The angel told me that too because he's going to be the son of the Most High. And Joseph says, yeah, and he's going to save the people from their sins. And, and they're just comparing notes. And Mary's a, One thing about Mary, she's a thinker. King James says she's a ponderer. I like that word. She ponders. It's like she's she's putting round pegs and round holes and square pegs and square holes. She's, she's kind, of make, kind of thinking, okay, let's go through all this. But here's, here's the thing that I didn't share with David before we started the service today because he says, if you read this, you know Mary already knows it's yes. Mary's a Jew. And if we know nothing, if you read through the scriptures, we know nothing about Jews. They've got to be told something over and over and over. You know, you, 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 you know God came to Abraham and says, I'm going to give you, you're going to be the, the father of, of great nation. You're going to have offspring it's more than the sands of the, on the beach. I mean, you're going to have this. You know, God told him this. God told him this. God told Moses these things, to, you know, certain things to a burning bush. And yet, somewhere along the line, they seem to forget. They seem to, yeah, I know he did, but. Yeah, he said this, but. You know, so. Sometimes you've got to be reminded over and over and over, and that's where I see these other instances coming into play in Mary's life. 
said, yeah, she had this great encounter with the, with the angel. Joseph had this great encounter with the angel. But how long is that going to last? You would think it would last forever, but by the, hist- by the, by the patterns in the history of her people, they have a tendency not to remember for a long time. They have a tendency to need to be reminded again, need to be punched again. <clears throat> Next point, Angels tells both parents what to name the baby. We talked about that. That Mary is going to be the son of the Most High. He's going to be the son of God. Um, Joseph, call him Jesus. I mean, it, it all, same thing we just talked about. Then, then people show up, point three, people show up at the manger with the aid of God's star. So Mary goes to Bethlehem, Mary and Joseph. She gets there. There's no room in the end. We know the story. She gets sent out to the manger. She has to have the baby in a feeding trough. Uh, it's kind of uneventful. And then all of a sudden, some shepherds show up. Uh, and they're, uh, you know, they've been told by an angel out in the fields. Let me just read this. Uh, and when the angels had gone away from them in heaven, you know, the angels have come and they've seen the shepherds and they've, you know, the glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill. They told him how to find the baby. The shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing which has happened which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. And when they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told to them about the child. And all who had heard it wondered at the things which were told by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen just has been told them. So the shepherds show up unannounced. Mary's, you know, just gone through this labor. She's had the baby. They're not in the best place. And all of a sudden, you know, knock, knock, knock. Uh, we've been sent here by an angel to worship your child. Well, I didn't send out any invitations. I haven't sent out an announcement yet. We just had the baby. Well, I'm, hey, angel came to us, brought a choir with them. They sang a little bit, sent us on our way, and we came to see this, this, this child, the Messiah. They, they shared all these things with Mary. This was a reminder, Mary. You know, nine months ago, angel came and visited you. Don't forget. Don't forget. You, you, you know Let's make sure you keep knowing we got the Messiah here. And we came to worship him. We didn't come to say, congratulations, that's a pretty baby. We came to praise him and to worship him because he's Messiah. And Mary pondered these things. She started, okay, I've got to file that away. I've got to remember that. i got an angel that came to me and said this. Now I've got shepherds coming unannounced that says this. Um, And they take him to see Simon, Simeon, Luke 2, verses 25 through 35. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit... Uh, into the temple, and when his parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out uh, for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms, and he blessed God, and he said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace. I've seen what you promised to let me see. I've seen the Christ. I can die a happy man. Mary's seeing all this. Mary's being reminded. Don't forget, Mary. Mary got the Messiah here. Don't forget. Which of, you, uh, which of you have prepared in the presence of all people a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel? And his father and mother were amazed at these things which were being said about him. I can see Mary pondering again. She's saying, you know, this thing is real. What the angel said, what the shepherd said, what Simeon said, oh, wait, there's more. 
Behold, this child is appointed to fall, uh, appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel, for a sign to be opposed. The words of this thought, I think, are based on Isaiah eight fourteen and fifteen, where it talks about a stone. Uh, uh, Christ will be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Christ is seen by Simeon as a stone in which some fall and are bruised. Luke twenty eighteen. If you want to write that down, I left some space in there for if you want to write notes. While others plant their feet upon it and rise to higher life, some, are, some stumble and are bruised. But there is, an, there is nothing to exclude the thought that some may first fall and then thoroughly soar. Bruised may rise again. If you look at Romans 11, 11. Though they fall, uh, may the, or through their fall, salvation may come. So Simeon is saying... This little guy is going to be the rise and fall of many. He's going to knock some down who are going to, going to see they needed to be knocked down, but now they can get back up and they can follow the Lord. Some are just going to be knocked down because they need to be knocked down, and some are going to be crushed. <clears throat> Anna, who was there when Simeon was blessing him, verses 36 and 38, and there was a prophetess, Anna, Anna the daughter of Phanuel, and of the tribe of Asher. And she was advanced in years and lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, serving night and day in fasting and prayers. At that very moment, during Simeon's blessing, she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak of him to all those that were looking for the redemption of, of uh, Jerusalem. While Simeon was, was praising God that I'm finally getting to see the, this you're, you're Christ, you know, and he's talking about he's going he's to be a, a, a stumbling block to some, or, or to get crushed by some, to call some to rise up. She starts talking to the crowd. She starts praising God, and, you know, she's some I've heard uh, Drew Smith one time refer to her as the first evangelist. You know, hey, see that little baby right there? That's the Messiah. Come on, you people have been looking for the redemption of Jerusalem? Right there. Here she goes, and she's off, and she's running with a message. Mary is hearing all this. Mary is seeing all this. So Mary, did you know? You think by now she does. A couple of years later, got the gift of the Magi. Matthew 2, 1 through 2. says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. And after hearing the king, they went their way and the star and uh, they went their way in the star which they had seen in the east went before them until it came and stood over the place where Christ was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and they worshipped him. Here you got Mary, you got a Two-ish year old child, is at home, you know, working with teaching him how to walk, teaching him how to speak. That, that amazes me when I think of that. You know, the creator of the world had to be taught his numbers, his letters, how to how to walk, how to speak, and yet Mary's doing this with him. All of a sudden here comes some more people. They start well, they start worshiping him. A star led them to her home so they could find him. Hey Mary, don't forget. Don't forget, Mary. For, you know, we told you at nine months before you had him. I gotta keep. Just want to make sure you don't forget. You know the question, Mary. Did you know? You, you know, but keep knowing. Keep knowing because you're gonna have a great message before too long. So I want to make sure you know. I'll make sure you understand exactly who this child is that you've got here. You have Jesus in the temple. 12 years old now. Oh, and by the way, uh, one of the things that, that I found interesting, you know, you know, we all know about the presence that the Magi bring, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and, you know, myrrh's and bombing fluid. So there was a message in that uh, along with, with uh, Simeon's message. message talked, uh, Simeon talked about the spear. Uh, and so... She's kind of being told, yeah, you got a Messiah, but he's got a mission. 
you know, he's not going to be this cute little baby in a manger forever. He's got a mission that's coming. So Mary, Mother Mary, you better get ready. Get ready because he, he came here for a reason. He came here for a purpose. So now you got Jesus in the temple, 12 years old. Luke the second chapter 41 through 51. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he became 12, Jesus, he went up there according to the custom of the feast. And as they were returning after spending the full number of days, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents were unaware of it. At this time, it's been 12 years since he was born. Now, again, based, this is not a, a slur, I guess might be the, you know, a racial slur or whatever, but based on the word of God, Jews love to have children. And evidently, you know, Joseph is still alive at this point. We know Joseph dies before the cross, but not sure exactly when. But at this point, uh, my guess is that they've got a passel full of kids because she lost one and didn't realize it. Now, speaking from a parent of one child, we knew how many steps David was away from us just about at every given moment, let alone losing. That just didn't happen. But she lost him. Uh, you know, she's traveling in a caravan. They've got all these people. And like I said, she's probably got a passel full of kids based on the fact that, you know, you got a people in exile for 400 years, I mean, in uh, captivity for 400 years in, uh, that under Egypt, and they multiplied to millions when they when during the, come time to Exodus. So they're all about having some babies. And I don't think Mary was any different. We know Jesus had brothers and sisters. Uh, but his parents, uh, but his parents weren't aware of it. But uh, but supposed him to be in the caravan and, and went a day's journey, and they began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. Uh, after three days, they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When they saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And he said to them, Why is it that you're looking for me? Did you not know I'm about my... Uh, did you not know that I had to be in my father's house. But they did not understand this statement which he had made to them. And he went down with them, and he came to Nazareth, and he continued to do in subjection to them. He continued to sit under their authority. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. Here she goes pondering again. Kind of think, maybe, did you forget? It's been 12 years. Did you forget a little bit, Mary? Did you forget who his father is? Son of the Most High? You know? Jesus says, I'm, I'm in my father's house. I'm about my father's business. And Mary's thinking, well, well, where's the tools? I don't see you building anything. You're building pews here. While you, what are you doing? Not that father. Mary has to be reminded, you know, Mary, do you still know? Do you, have you forgot? It's focus, Mary. You know. Then we have... This is one I really found interesting. This is one that I almost want to retitle. The mirror, it's called the miracle at Cana. Um, I, when I read this and when I studied this and looked through it, I learned something that I'd never known before. This is where Mary and Jesus' relationship is defined. And where it completely changes. You know, uh, this is found in John chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. It says, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples, and at this time he had about five disciples, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Now, it appears that Mary may have had some kind of role in this wedding, like you see, you know, servers or 
have somebody sign the book or whatever. It, she had a role in this thing because she got concerned they were out of wine, whereas Jesus was a guest. He was an invited guest. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with us? Um, being raised by a, a half Cherokee Indian, I mean, that right there is the miracle, the fact that he said, woman? And she didn't get, he didn't get one of these like I'm sporting right now, this black eye. Um, that, that would be a miracle. If I said that to my mother, I guarantee you I'd have a black eye. But it's very significant the way he addressed her there. He says, woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Mary may have considered the crisis providential. Perhaps she thinks it is time for Jesus to present himself to the world as the Messiah. John the Baptist has already designated him as the Messiah. Uh, he already has a following of disciples. A well-timed miracle could be the means by which he declares his identity to their problem, being out of wine. Mary is careful not to tell Jesus what to do, but it seems clear that she hopes he will do something. Jesus knows that his mother expects a response of some kind, and he gives her one, though it is hardly what she expects. It's not an unkind response. It simply serves to set the record straight by redefining their relationship to Mary. His other earthly mother, Mary, Jesus does not call her Mary or mother, but he calls her woman. This is the same as Jesus telling uh, well, I lost my place. He calls her woman. This is the same term Jesus is used when he speaks to her from the cross. If you look at John 19. By calling her woman, Jesus begins distancing himself from her authority and focuses on the Father's authority. Um, Jesus is telling Mary... I really am about my father's business now. And I can no longer respond to your authority. You know, I will do what is my father's will, not your will. That is why I'm here. That is what I have to focus on. Uh, Mary says, whatever he tells you, talking to the servants, he says, whatever he tells you, do it. She does not argue with him, for he has made his point. By her words, it appears that she leaves her request in his hands to deal, deal with as he sees fit. That's what we're supposed to do as believers. We make our request to the Lord, but we leave it in his hands to do with it as he wants to do. You know, not thy, my, my will, but thy will. He may not tell her, the servants, uh, he may not tell, he may not tell the servants to do anything, Yet if he does tell them to do something, anything, they should obey. For then it is by good, his good pleasure and done in his good time. And that's, that's what I see in that passage. It is gone from Jesus, son of Mary, to Jesus, Savior of Mary. Mary, I am no longer baby Jesus. It is my Father's will that's what's important and not yours. And I respectfully have to tell you, I'll deal with it in whatever I deem necessary. And she's good with it. She just steps away and says, servants, it's his show now. Whatever he says, run with it. It's his show. Because he's following the Father's will now. The greatest thing Mary ever said, in my opinion, or, the, or maybe that may be the wrong way to say it. The greatest testimony Mary ever had was uh, the, what I call the silence at the cross found in John 19, verses 26 through 27. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom lo he loved standing by, nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to his disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour the disciple took her into his own house. You know, Ron has taught it for years. Uh, I'm speaking to visitors. I'm speaking to the Internet, whatever. But we know that, that Jesus appointed John to be Mary's son, to take care of his mother, because uh, Jesus didn't feel like his brothers and sisters were 
capable of it at that time. They weren't believers. As a matter of fact, they all thought Jesus was crazy. Until after his resurrection did they become Christians. So Jesus had to appoint somebody to look after his mother. And he did that with John. But the thing, the, thing the, the greatest witness to me at the cross was Mary's silence. You know, we all have mothers. We, you know, Mary has to watch her innocent son get crucified, get convicted of a crime, and be put to death. And she stayed silent because she understood, maybe if it's back as far as the miracle at Cana, she understood he's Messiah. I named him Jesus because that's what the angel said, because he's got to save the people from their sins. And this is how he's going to do it. This is where he's going to do it. I can't scream, let, take him down, he's an innocent man. You horrible Romans for killing him. You horrible Jews for killing him. You know, you can blame whoever you want to blame. Christ, nobody killed him. Christ gave it up because that's what Christ came to do. But Mary's silence there. Again, I, I, in my own personal life, I guarantee my mother wouldn't put up with it. I guarantee my mother-in-law wouldn't put up with it. She would fight somebody to the death, especially if she thought I was innocent. He didn't do that. He's not a blasphemer. You know, he's innocent. But she didn't do that because she understood who Christ was. So when that song says, Mary, did you know that Christ will save your sons and daughters? I think so. I think it may have took her time to figure it out. I'm not so sure she knew it at, at that manger. She was told it, but all through her life there was little reminders, little reminders. You know, uh, he's, he's, he's capable of doing miracles. That's, that's the, the God in him, you know, son of the most high. He's got deity in him. Yeah. She understood that. She, you know, when she made that statement and when he was 12 that, you know, he said, I'm about my father's business, and she didn't, oh, I don't understand that. She had to ponder on it a little bit. And then she had to be reminded, you know, the Holy Spirit is the one that conceived Jesus, not Joseph. So let me, ask, let me ask you, do you know who Jesus is? Mary does. Mary, Mary has figured it out at the cross. Mary is shouting as loud as she can at the cross in her silence, even though she's suffering, even though she's in great pain to watch the baby Jesus that grew up to be this man, watching her son die, she knows he's got to. He's got to save his people from their sins. He's got to die on that cross for the sin of the world. And in doing so, he's going to take that punishment that God had for us. Because of one man, Romans 5.12, because of one man, Adam, he brought sin into the world, and it was passed upon all of us. And so we've got this penalty that says we're sinners. We've got to die. We've got to pay the price for that sin. And 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that he who knew no sin became sin for us. He took our place. He took on that penalty. We don't go to hell now because of sin. Do not go to hell because of sin. You go to hell either because you reject Christ. Christ took care of sin. So now it's about putting your faith in Christ. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He came to save his people from their sins. That's how he does it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ died on the cross for the sin of the world. And then he was raised again three days later. The love of God raised him from the dead. He's alive. He's a living, living Savior. That's what we put our faith in. That's where our salvation comes from. And that's what this little baby being born, born in a manger is all about. Mary, did you know that he will save his sons and daughters? Well, people, I hope you know that he came to save us. I truly hope you do. If you don't, today is the day of salvation. We are not promised tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. And it is by faith and faith alone that we are saved. Saved by faith through grace and not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. Ephesians, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. And so if you're here today, the internet, wherever, if you've never got the greatest gift, and we're going to look into this gift at the second half, but if you've never received the greatest gift you could ever receive, the person of Jesus Christ, Merry Christmas. You've got it.
by faith. Trust in Christ today. Put your, put your faith in the fact that Christ died for you. William, he died for you. Michelle, he died for you. He died for Tony. You know, sometimes we say that you and it just goes over everybody's head. You've got to make it personal. He died for me. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you so much that we can celebrate the birth of our Savior but we need to focus on the fact that he is our Savior. We pray now, Father, that you encourage anyone that has never come to know Christ as their Savior that today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for the sin of the world. They buried his dead body. He was as dead as can be. And you raised him from the dead. He's resurrected. And by putting our faith in that, we are... We are now born again. We are one of your children. And we will be able to live with you forever. We will be able to live in that same kingdom that he's going to be king of forever and ever. We will live in it with him. Just pray, Father, that you make this message clear to everyone that hears, those that need it especially. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
this is a second portion of the service today. We're going to do some Christmas music. It's congregational. Uh, we're all going to do, see some songs. Uh, we've got to present the present at the end. So we just got all kinds of good stuff we're going to do today. Um, we're going to start out with a favorite, a traditional O Come All You Faithful. If you want to stand and sing, it's your prerogative. You know, some people say, why don't we stand and sing? Well, if you want to stand and sing, please.
Speaking of going telling it on the mountain, this is the portion where I'm going to do the uh, Christmas story. And uh, I'm going to be reading from the book of Grinch today. <laughs> so if you've got your books of Grinch, you can turn with me. Uh, if not, maybe they're in your pew. I'm not sure. Page 27. I'm just going to tell the story, and then I'll get into the reading part in just a minute. There was this guy, big old ugly green guy, lived on top of a mountain, and he was called the Grinch. And he hated everybody. And he thought everybody hated him, and he reveled in the fact that everybody hated him. He didn't care. And every year at the same time, there was these people down at the bottom of the mountain that were known as the Who's. They would celebrate this holiday, and they would decorate the town, and they would cook and sing songs and give presents and just have the best time, and he hated it. Ah, he hated it. And so he decided one year, he says, I'm going to put a stop to this. I am going to go down there in the middle of the night while they're all asleep, and I'm going to steal everything they got down there that's got anything to do with this holiday day that they're singing about and celebrating and carrying on about. So I'm tired of it. I'll take that away, and I'll put a stop to it. So sure enough, on the eve of this big holiday, he sneaks down into Whoville, and he takes all the presents, and he takes all the decorations, and he takes the Christmas tree, he takes all the food, he even takes the Who pudding. Takes the Who pudding. And he steals it all, takes it back up to the top of this mountain, and then he can't wait for sunrise because at sunrise he's going to hear the who's going boo-hoo. Boo-hoo, hoo-hoo-hoo. And he is so excited about this. But what happens is sun comes up and all of a sudden he hears this singing going on. And it's happy singing and it's glad singing. The book of Grinch, it says, and the Grinch with his Grinch feet ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled three hours till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't thought of before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps means a little bit more. He misjudged the who's. He took away the ribbons, took away their tags, took away all the stuff that he says, that's Christmas. But you know what? He didn't take away Christmas. He didn't take away Christmas. Because he didn't know what they knew. And it came to pass in those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because it was the house and lineage of David. He was to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that, she, uh, that she, she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, an angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. He didn't understand that that stuff is not Christmas. That stuff is it's fun. 
know, I'm not knocking it, but it's not Christmas. This starts Christmas, and this ends Christmas. The angel said it most clearly, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. Johnny, you got a Savior. Jeannie, you got a Savior. Richard, you've got a Savior. Ron, you've got a Savior. That's what Christmas is, and that's what he failed to get. That's what he failed to get. That's what we understand, and this is what we want to take to the world right now. It's Christmas time. What a better time to take the message. He sent us a Savior. That Christ came to die for us. Cassidy sang such a wonderful song. He made a way through a manger. He brought us a Savior. That's what this holiday is all about. Please take that message to the world. This is what a better time to do it. I said it at the first half. Christ died for our sins. He died on the cross. He was buried. God raised him from the dead. We, we worship a risen, living Savior. The, the shepherds, the wise men, uh, Simeon, Anna, they got to worship a living Savior. And guess what? So do we. So do we. Remind people of what this season's about. Al said people are depressed, people are sad, but well, it's because of that. You take that away, you still got Christmas. You still got Christmas. I want to wish everybody here a Merry Christmas. I want to end in a prayer, and then David is going to finish this out with a song. Let us, let us pray. Father, thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you for this, this season. Thank you that we live in a country that recognizes it as a, as a holy day where we can stop and pause and reflect on Christ the Savior. We just pray, Father, that, that make this message real to us all so that we can make it real to others. We thank you. We love you. We praise you. And all of God's children said, in Jesus' name, amen.